In the year 1770 when Lieutenant James Cook and his crew first set foot on the continent now known as Australia, their initial interaction was with the Gugu Yimitha people near present-day Cooktown. Cook, on behalf of the Kingdom of Great Britain, claimed the east coast of Australia as New South Wales. However, whether this claim was officially made during Cook's visit remains a subject of historical debate. Cook's orders were explicit, to explore a vast continent and, with the consent of the indigenous inhabitants, establish British presence in the name of the king. British colonization of Australia commenced in earnest in 1788 when Governor Arthur Phillip and the First Fleet arrived at Port Jackson. Phillip's instructions were clear, establish peaceful relations with the indigenous peoples and promote amity and kindness. Yet, the immediate response from the Eora, the first indigenous people to witness this arrival, was a mix of surprise and aggression. The Eora were offended by the British entering their lands, exploiting resources without seeking permission, an act contrary to customary Aboriginal society. In the months that followed, interactions between the British and the Eora were marked by tension, while some exchanges, including the gifting of items, did occur between the Eora and the Tharawal at Botany Bay, they were exceptions. For the most part, the Eora avoided British settlements, deeply disturbed by the intrusion into their territories. A significant turning point came when Governor Phillip decided to capture indigenous people to teach them English, intending for them to act as intermediaries. This led to the abduction of Arabanu and Benelong. Philip himself was speared by Benelong's companion during these events. Benelong, in a remarkable twist of history, would later travel to England in 1793. Other indigenous individuals, like Bungary, also ventured on voyages with Europeans. The first calamity to befall the indigenous peoples appeared in April 1789. A disease, likely smallpox, swept through the aboriginal communities around Port Jackson, leaving devastation in its wake. Before the epidemic, the population of the Eora was on par with that of the first fleet settlers. However, after this catastrophic event, the indigenous population dwindled significantly, and by 1820, it was a mere fraction of its former self. In the generations following colonization, the Eora, Durig, and Karingai peoples were pushed to the fringes of European society. Indigenous communities struggled to maintain their traditional kinship systems and cultural practices. Disease, violence, and a depressingly low birth rate further compounded their challenges. By the second generation of contact, many indigenous groups in southeastern Australia had vanished from the landscape. In the southern reaches of this vast continent, a similar tragedy unfolded. Aboriginal Tasmanians first encountered Europeans during the Borden expedition in 1802. Surprisingly, the French explorers showed greater friendliness to the indigenous people compared to their British counterparts further north. However, darker aspects of European interactions soon emerged. European whalers, visiting the Bay Strait Islands in 1800, engaged in the kidnapping of Aboriginal women. Local indigenous groups were also involved in the sale of women to these sailors. Tragically, the descendants of these women would eventually become the last survivors of Tasmania's indigenous population. The impact of British colonization in Australia is a haunting chapter in history, filled with the echoes of encounters that forever altered the course of a continent and the lives of its first inhabitants. The tale of Australia's colonization is a haunting saga of the assimilation of indigenous cultures and the violence that marred the encounter between European settlers and the original inhabitants. The seeds of assimilation were sown by Governor Macquarie in 1814 when he established the native institution in Blacktown. This institution aimed to civilize the aboriginal population, making their lifestyles more domesticated and industrious. Children were enrolled in residential schools, marking the beginning of a profound cultural transformation. By 1817, 17 indigenous children were attending, one of whom, a girl named Maria, astounded everyone by winning the top prize in a school exam in 1819, surpassing even European children. Unfortunately, the institution's doors closed soon after due to expenditure concerns. Macquarie's attempts to resettle 16 Karingai people at George's Head also faced challenges, as the families quickly sold their farms and departed. Christian missions sprouted across the land in places like Lake Macquarie in 1827, Wellington Valley in 1832, and Port Phillip and Moreton Bay around 1840.
These missions were not just about religion but also involved learning indigenous languages. In 1831, a missionary translated the Gospel of Luke into a Wabagal, a significant step in cultural exchange. Indigenous people often sought food and sanctuary at these missions. However, when supplies ran low, many indigenous individuals left for pastoral stations in search of work. Some missionaries even took indigenous children without consent and housed them in dormitories. The government initiated blanket distribution in the 1830s but terminated it in 1844 as a cost-saving measure. Additionally, Indigenous paramilitary units called the Australian Native Police were established in various regions, including Port Phillip, New South Wales, and Queensland. Astonishingly, the Port Phillip unit wielded police powers over white settlers as well. These forces engaged in the violent suppression of indigenous populations, leading to the deaths of hundreds, or even up to a thousand, indigenous people. In 1833, a committee of the British House of Commons, led by Fowell Buxton, demanded better treatment for the indigenous people, referring to them as the original owners. This led to the creation of the Office of the Protector of Aborigines in 1838, an effort aimed at safeguarding their rights and welfare. Regrettably, this initiative ceased by 1857. Nonetheless, the humanitarian efforts did lead to the Waste Land Act of 1848, which granted indigenous people specific rights and reserves on the land. It's important to note that assimilation wasn't a one-sided process. Some Europeans found themselves absorbed into indigenous cultures. William Buckley, an escaped convict, lived among the Wartharong people near Melbourne for 32 years before being rediscovered in 1835. He fully embraced their language and customs. James Morrill, an English sailor shipwrecked off the northeastern coast in 1846, was adopted by a local clan of Aboriginal Australians, adopting their way of life for 17 years. The arrival of Europeans in Australia was, unfortunately, not marked by peaceful coexistence but rather by conflict, pain, and tragedy. As European settlers pushed further into the continent, prolonged conflicts followed their advance. This era of violence claimed the lives of an estimated minimum of 40,000 indigenous Australians and between 2,000 and 2,500 settlers in what are now known as the Frontier Wars. Recent research in Queensland suggests that the indigenous death toll may have been much higher, particularly due to its larger pre-contact indigenous population. In fact, it's believed that up to 3,000 white settlers lost their lives in the frontier violence. One of the earliest indigenous resistance leaders was Pemelwoy in Sydney, who waged a guerrilla-style warfare on the settlers during the Hawkesbury and Nepean Wars from 1790 to 1816. After his death in 1802, his son Tedbury continued the campaign until 1810. The response from the British authorities was to ban Aboriginal groups of more than six people and restrict them from carrying weapons within two kilometres of settlements. Violence also erupted beyond the Cumberland Plain, with the Bathurst War against the Wiradjuri and the Black War in Van Diemen's Land. In the latter, indigenous warriors, including leaders like Mosquito and Tare Nyorara, retaliated against settlers in response to the expansion of settlements and sheep farming. The Black War, characterized by guerrilla warfare on both sides, claimed the lives of 600 to 900 Aboriginal people and over 200 European colonists, nearly wiping out Tasmania's indigenous population. This tragic episode has led historians to debate whether it should be labeled as an act of genocide. Conflict also reached Swan River Colony near Perth, where the government provided settlers access to the armory for self-defense. The story of colonization in Australia is one of deep complexity, marked by the relentless push for assimilation and the brutal consequences of conflict between two worlds colliding on this ancient land. As the British settlers arrived on Australian shores, they unintentionally brought with them deadly infectious diseases like smallpox, influenza, and tuberculosis. These diseases would become one of the most devastating factors in the decline of the Aboriginal population. Among these diseases, smallpox stands out as a particularly ruthless killer, responsible for claiming more than 50% of the Aboriginal population. In April 1789, a major outbreak of smallpox erupted, sweeping through indigenous communities between Hawkesbury River, Broken Bay, and Port Hacking.
the Aboriginal people of the Sydney region had never encountered this disease before and lacked immunity against it. Frightened and unable to comprehend the sickness, many fled, leaving the sick with some food and water to fend for themselves. As clans scattered, the epidemic spread further along the coast and into the hinterland. The consequences for Aboriginal society were catastrophic. Many of the skilled hunters and gatherers who played vital roles in their communities fell victim to the disease. Those who survived the initial outbreak faced starvation due to the loss of their productive members. The origins of this smallpox outbreak have been a subject of debate. Some have suggested that Makazar fishermen accidentally introduced smallpox to Australia's north, with the virus then spreading southward. However, given that the spread of the disease typically depends on high population densities, and the fact that those who fell ill were soon unable to move, this scenario is improbable. A more likely source of the disease was the variolas matter brought by Surgeon John White on the First Fleet. However, how this material may have been transmitted remains uncertain. There has even been speculation that the vials were intentionally or accidentally released as a form of biological weapon. Recent research suggests that British Marines were probably responsible for spreading smallpox, possibly without informing Governor Philip. However, despite these theories, today's evidence only allows for a balancing of probabilities. In 1822, the British government reduced duties on Australian wool, sparking an expansion of sheep numbers and increased immigration. Sheep thrived in the arid western plains, but this transformation had profound environmental consequences. Settlers' cattle consumed local grasses and trampled waterholes, leading to a decrease in vital food sources like mernong and the spread of new weeds. Traditional diets were altered as meat sources like kangaroo and the Australian brush turkey were replaced by cattle. Indigenous peoples had to adapt to these changes by appropriating settler resources, such as taking sheep and raising their own flocks. New economic products, like steel axes replacing traditional stone ones, disrupted traditional lifestyles. These steel axes were often given to younger indigenous people by settlers and missionaries in exchange for labor, diminishing established trading networks. As indigenous people lost their lands, they were forced to migrate to pastoral stations, missions, and towns due to food scarcity. Tobacco, tea, and sugar also played roles in attracting indigenous people to settlers. However, this often led to a situation where work was demanded from them in return for rations. Indigenous employment encompassed various roles, including cutting timber, herding and shearing sheep, and stock work. They also worked as fishermen, water carriers, domestic servants, boatmen, and whalers. Yet, the European work ethic was not ingrained in their culture, and they often viewed working beyond immediate needs as unimportant. Moreover, their wages were unequal compared to settlers, consisting mostly of rations or less than half the wage. Traditional gender roles were disrupted as well, with men becoming the primary recipients of wages and rations, while women could at most find European-style domestic work or prostitution. This shift even led some indigenous women to live with European men who had access to resources. 